D'accord, je me fais le plaisir euh, ici euh, de modérer cet atelier purement international parce que les intervenants euh, tous parlent anglais. Alors, euh, il y a six intervenants ici. Il y a d'abord euh, M. Becker euh, Berne, parce qu'il vient de me dire tout à l'heure que c'est Bernard, plutôt Bernard, qui va intervenir ou qui va nous donner trois exemples de l'intelligence artificielle dans les secteurs de la santé. Il y aura aussi euh, Keren et Oscock qui vont les deux intervenir sur le robot domestique, parce que j'ai interprété un peu, j'ai essayé de les traduire en français, et le professeur Soudé, j'espère qu'ils sont en ligne, et qui va euh, intervenir sur l'intelligence artificielle à propos de la protection des enfants, et puis euh, Abdoulaye Saloufou qui va nous dire comment les chats GPT bouleversent les droits d'auteur. Et ensuite, il y aura aussi Osuji, qui va intervenir sur l'intelligence artificielle dans la diffusion et l'apprentissage à distance. Et puis, euh, Messier Livbo, qui va intervenir pour terminer euh, sur l'intelligence artificielle et l'impact de la communication euh, interculturelle. Alors, euh, je m'en vais euh, rapidement donner euh, la parole à M. Becker, Berne, pour euh, nous donner les trois exemples sur, euh, dans les secteurs de la santé sur l'intelligence artificielle. M. Becker, vous avez la parole. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Mesdames et Messieurs, euh, bonjour à tous. Euh, merci beaucoup pour euh, l'invitation. I was told it's okay to speak English in this session, so uh, thank you for that. Um, my name is uh, Bernd Beckert. Um, I'm a researcher at the Fraunhofer Institute for Systems and Innovation Research in Germany, in, in Karlsruhe, in the southern part of Germany. And um, I will uh, speak about trustworthy AI today in the health sector. So, but since I am the first speaker, Um, I thought it, maybe it's a good idea to give you a short, um, okay, you <laughs> want the microphone closer to me, okay. So I want to give you a short overview of uh, AI in health. So what can AI be used for in health? Uh, what good can it do for healthcare and uh, what the challenges are? So how can AI improve um, the health system? So I need to go to my next slide here. Okay, no? So, okay, that works, okay. Um, so the question is how can AI improve healthcare, well, in um, developing countries or in Europe or elsewhere in the world? Um, and um, first of all, one has to say that there are very many um, uh, application fields. Uh, for artificial intelligence in health, and so I grouped them into four different areas. So it's diagnostics, treatment, patient uh, engagement, and administrative uh, support, I would say. So in the context of diagnostics, the most activity today is um, surely in the imaging area. Here, uh, pattern recognition is used to analyze and classify images, for example, in radiology. Um, AI tools can um, allow doctors to better understand what kind of cancer or other diseases uh, they are looking at. So that's medical imaging, but there is also symptom checker systems uh, which can be used to improve diagnostics. Uh, here the system asks uh, the patient a series of questions about their symptoms and then based on their answers informs them about the appropriate next steps, so what needs to um, be done next. And symptom checkers can be used, for example, in the so-called one-minute clinics. So these are clinics where uh, patients go to and find first help. So, for example, in uh, underserved areas or in rural areas. And um, then after the first information about uh, the symptoms, they can get connected to a doctor who is using a video conferencing tool, for example. Then we have clinical support, uh, clinical decision support systems. Um, 
and uh, outcome predictions of treatments. So let me just quickly look at the watch to see so that we're not, then I'm not taking too much time here. <laughs> okay. Um, this is clinical decision support systems. They build on intelligent combinations of uh, available patient and uh, medical data, and they integrate state-of-the-art research. So it's something that really is a, um, a complex uh, system uh, which um, includes all kind of data and which combines this in an intelligent way. So, but AI can also help to um, enhance public um, patient engagement, for example, uh, by using smart watches or wearables, where people can check their health status or detect anomalies uh, and help them make uh, health conscious decisions. And the fourth area is the administrative area where AI can be used to support medical staff to document the patient's consultations, for example, in speech to text systems. So they can uh, save a lot of time when um, the doctor doesn't have to write down everything that uh, was uh, spoken in the consultation, but the system does this automatically. And also, of course, uh, health insurances uh, can use AI to speed up the process of evaluating claims. So there are very many um, application fields of AI in healthcare today. Um, some of them are in practical use already. Um, but very many of them are still in a first phase, in a developing phase, so they are not used yet, but uh, they are experimented with. So, now that we have seen the uh, opportunities and advantages of AI, what are the challenges of these systems? So, um, firstly, one has to say, since AI systems, they massively rely on data on which they are trained on, the quality of the data is important. Incomplete or skewed data could lead to wrongful diagnostics or therapy recommendations. So big data also leads to the discrimination of gender, of ethnicity, or of the socially disadvantaged if the data is not really um, uh, good. Another challenge is the um, doctor-patient relationship. So when the doctor uses an AI system, will he or she be able to explain to the patient what the um, decision was about or how he, he came to the decision? And uh, the question is, are AI recommendations today good enough to be trusted? Uh, and finally, of course, uh, um, who is accountable if uh, something goes wrong? And uh, actually here I'm in the middle of my topic already, uh, which is um, trustworthy AI. And the central question in this discussion is, what does it take for an AI system to be trustworthy? So when do I, in fact, trust the AI system? Uh, and <clears throat> here we relate to the concept of um, trustworthy AI of the European Commission, which was developed already in 2019 by a high-level expert group uh, in, in Europe, and um, which has uh, dominated the discussion on trustworthiness uh, in, an AI, in AI since. So the concept has seven dimensions, uh, seven requirements. Uh, many of you might uh, know this concept, and the requirements are human agency and oversight, techno technically robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, and then non-discrimination and fairness, as I have mentioned already, uh, societal and environmental well-being, so that's something that AI should also be responsible for, and accountability. So, in fact, there's a large consensus that these four, uh, seven dimensions are the relevant aspects of trustworthy AI, um, and which shall be considered when implementing uh, AI systems in the different applications domains, not only in health, but also other application domains. So when you start developing or when you go and implement AI systems, so these are the seven requirements you should uh, look at and you should um, take care of. But then, how do you do this, actually? And how do you do this in practice? Um, since the concept came into the being, the concept um, uh, um, uh, was in, in the world, there were very many attempts to translate this concept, um, which is a rather abstract concept, into practical guidelines or checklists for programmers or um, for AI project manage managers, so they know what to do 
in order to um, meet all these requirements. One example I brought for such a guideline is a guideline by the AI Ethics Group, which is a consortium um, led by the German Association of Information Technologies, and they have developed a very comprehensive list uh, with many levels. As you see, you cannot read everything that's written there, but they have many levels, indicators, and sub-indicators to check um, when implementing AI systems, and they said, this is necessary in order to achieve a high level of trustworthiness. So the idea was here to avoid a seal of approval, which is similar to the, ele to the energy level for uh, electricity. Um, but this is only, you see, this is a very complicated thing, but this is only one concept um, um, which should help to put the, uh, there's only one guideline to help to put the concept into practice. and. Um, a lot of energy has been put into the translation um, of practical guidelines and we have <coughs> over 50 concepts um, that try to um, make this a, a reality. So, <coughs> um, when we look at what um, they do in order to make it a reality, there's uh, a lot of activity, however, what we observe is that there is an, op uh, an obvious implementation gap uh, when it comes to real projects. So, as I said, I'm from the Fraunhofer Institute and our role as an institute in the German re uh, research landscape is uh, to put scientific results into practice. Uh, and here we wanted to find good practices implementing uh, the concepts and to give other companies advice on how they can do this by themselves. So the problem was, however, that we couldn't find any uh, best practices, uh, any projects where this was exercised in a, in, a, in a good way. In fact, the companies and organizations we talked about, uh, talked to, they said that the concept of trustworthy AI is somehow important. It is uh, it's a good concept, uh, and uh, um, we, we think we need it. But at right now, at this moment, we have other problems uh, which we need to care of. So. Um, um, AI um, um, projects have a, a different focus right now. So what we did as, an, uh, as Fraunhofer, we invited experts from companies and univers universities and also from research institutes who have at least attempted to implement some aspects of the concept. So not the whole thing, but um, we invited um, people um, who took some of the aspects um, of the concept in, into their projects and we organized a symposium, a scientific symposium in Karlsruhe last October and um, um, congregated those people. And at the symposium there were very many um, uh, presentations and contributions and I have selected three actually, three use cases which I would like to uh, present to you today in a very short fashion to illustrate uh, the current state of implementing trustworthy AI. Um, so, and these uh, use cases are from three experts. These are the experts here who are also the co-authors of the article we have submitted uh, for this conference here today. So the first project is a chatbot app um, uh, that is used as a digital companion. So what is it? Uh, it's an app which uh, heart patients can use uh, to document their daily health state. So uh, they can put in uh, their symptoms uh, and they can do this by using a speech-to-text system. So they don't have to write it down uh, as they would usually do. Heart failure patients, they have a limited uh, life expectancy and they need to be very closely monitored. So this app provides them with an easy way of tracking their disease. And doctors can also access their data if the patients choose to share it with them. So and how is trustworthiness addressed here in this app? Um, here it's the data protection and data security, which are the most important aspects. Uh, in this project, uh, the way to ensure this was to store personal data and uh, clinical data or health data on separate servers. So it's not on the same server but separately uh, stored uh, and users can also decide uh, by themselves whom they want to share the data with. So we have a full transparency in uh, this project here. And the second project uh, is a project from the University of Freiburg also in Germany. Here we look at um, 
an AI-based diagnostic tool for epilepsy in patients in this case. And what AI does here is that it analyzes EEGs to find pathological patterns uh, in uh, patients' brain waves. So these patterns, they can indicate an incident. They are very relevant for a diagnostic process. So now, whereas AI systems today can actually distinguish between uh, healthy and pathological curves, the doctors, they, um, uh, for doctors, it is not transparent how the system came to this decision. So they don't know what um, information th this decision of the system is based on. Um, so what is required here is explainability. So in order to make doctors and patients to trust the system. And to do, to, to do this in this project, an invertible neural network was used uh, to find out how the system actually arrived at um, the results, which makes it then understandable for people who use the project. And a third project, very quickly, um, um, is a clinical decision support system, which was developed by another Fraunhofer Institute and which uh, was called uh, AI in Medicine. In this project, uh, the developers, they have integrated different data sources in order to support therapy. So here, um, patient's data is combi combined with research data and information uh, can be given about how a specific therapy has affected an average patient uh, in the same cohort. So this is something the AI does very well. It looks for averages and then it can say how this affected the patients uh, in, in, in the same cohort. So this is a really highly sophisticated project uh, with complex combinations of data. Um, and for experts here who are involved in building this project, um, it was important to retain human oversight. So what does it mean? Um, it means the program, the system that was programmed in a way that doctors um, do not get automated recommendations, but they receive uh, suggestions from the system which they can integrate into their own decision making. So it's not a one-on-one -on -one, um, thing that the machine says, here is my recommendation and you have to follow or people automatically follow it. But uh, it's just a suggestion and uh, doctors can take, take it up, pick it up or um, have their own uh, look at it. And also they program the dashboard which vis visualizes the full transparent, uh, visualizes um, um, the information for the full transparency. So now I come to my conclusion and um, conclusion is um, that in our research we have seen that the concept of trustworthiness is important, it's very important and it's also a good model to make de um, developers and um, producers aware of the critical aspects of AI as I have showed you. So it's uh, really something they can um, look at and they can, can use. However, the projects uh, we have seen um, where ethical aspects played a role indeed not all the seven requirements of the concepts were equally important or relevant. So, in fact, different uh, projects picked up certain dimensions or requirements um, and neglected others. So we have not found a single project in which all of the seven requirements were equally important and covered. So, uh, and at last, uh, we also observed that uh, currently in uh, Europe the discussion has shifted from implementation to regulation. So these days we talk a lot about the uh, draft AI Act and uh, less about best practice implementation of trustworthy AI. So uh, it seems that regulation these days has taken over from experimentation and um, that um, all the, the wonderful research projects that we have where we can analyze are now replaced by um, uh, discussions about how to best regulate the, the, the AI area in the health sector. So, thank you for your attention. Merci, uh, Monsieur Becker. Alors, je vais demander à Peter de nous faire un petit résumé par rapport à ces contenus là. Peter, vous avez la parole. Merci, merci beaucoup, uh, Madeleine, and uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. So, I'll just have a quick uh, translation uh, to French. Uh, after presentation to so just give a little bit of picture around what you have presented. Donc, 
Il a présenté euh, sur, bon, les thématiques de cet euh, panel, c'est autour de l'IA et santé. Euh, donc, il nous avait présenté les sujets de confiance en IA euh, dans les secteurs, euh, dans les, euh, secteurs santé. Euh, il nous avait parlé des opportunités, le côté, euh, les avantages d'utiliser IA dans les secteurs santé et aussi euh, les difficultés actuelles. Sur les opportunités, il a parlé des côtés diagnostiques, euh, les usages de IA dans les imageries euh, pour arriver à trouver les maladies détectées euh, et aussi éviter les erreurs humaines ou faciliter que euh, les techniciens peuvent utiliser comme on ça, les IA comme on a un outil d'accompagnement. Donc ça, c'est le les premier volet. Le deuxième, c'est plutôt sur les euh, euh, traitements, donc euh, prédiction, euh, prédiction du traitement et aussi euh, comment on peut développer euh, les médicaments. Uh, le troisième, il nous avait aussi parlé du fait que l'IA peut aussi aider sur le côté engagement des citoyens, donc uh, en relation entre les, je dis citoyens, engagement des patients et aussi uh, les services médicaux. Um, et uh, les derniers, il avait parlé du côté administratif, sur so, tous les volets administratifs, les, les papiers uh, et toute cette partie. Sur so, les challenges, il nous avait parlé du fait que euh, Ce n'est pas évident pour avoir les gouvernances des données, les données qui ne sont peut-être pas complètes, ça pose en question. Euh, les données qui sont aussi biaisées peuvent aussi euh, donner le résultat vraiment mauvais. Euh, et aussi, le sujet qui est aussi important, c'est le sujet de confiance. Et ça, c'est le centre de euh, sa présentation, euh, les, euh, les côtés de confiance et les transparences. Okay. Uh, il nous avait parlé d'un concept autour de confiance et à la confiance. Il nous avait parlé de sept uh, points clés. Uh, I'm talking about the seven points that you relisted. Re Donc, il y avait sept principes et dans les sept principes, les questions, c'est comment on peut traduire, voilà, donc c'est toute cette partie qui parle des uh, les données privées, les transparences, les diversités. Um, les côtés robustness autour des technicités des euh, les IA. Mais les questions qui se posent, c'est comment on peut traduire tout ça euh, dans l'implémentation. Et c'est souvent les, les questions qui viennent, c'est joli, on met les, les principes, mais comment on peut mettre ça en pratique pratique. Euh, donc, il nous avait sorti euh, trois euh, approches euh, qui viennent de, en bas, donc top, top bottom up, right, mm -hmm. uh, comment on peut, comment on donc il nous avait sorti trois applications qui a sorti, le premier c'est un chatbot, uh, un chatbot, le deuxième c'est, donc le chatbot, uh, une des choses pour booster les transparences, c'est que le fait que les données privées sont stockées dans un serveur séparé, et ça, ça pose une question, j'ai une question autour de ça, est-ce que le fait que les applications s'hébergent dans un serveur et les données sont stockées dans un autre serveur. Ça booste, euh, c'est plutôt transparent ou pas, ça donne les confiances ou pas. Ça, c'est quelque chose qu'il faut voir. Un deuxième volet, euh, une deuxième application, c'est euh, Pattern Recognition. Donc, c'est plutôt le côté diagnostique. Donc, euh, les usages, de, comment on peut avoir les côtés explicabilité du résultat que les IA donnent. Donc ça, c'est les, les deuxième application. Les troisième, euh, c'est plutôt les clinical decision support. Donc, euh, on utilise IA pour aussi donner les suggestions, les recommandations pour les services médicaux pour, pour décider est-ce qu'on prend en compte ou, 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 ou pas du tout. Donc, c'est le résumé de sa, sa présentation. Et dans les conclusions, il, il nous sort, euh, comment dire ça, en fait, aujourd'hui, il y a pas mal de sujets autour des régulations euh, qui sortent beaucoup. Et les concepts de confiance en IA, c'est quelque chose qui est super important. Donc, tout le monde parle de ça. Euh, voilà. Donc, en résumé, ça parle de tout ce type de sujet. Voilà. Merci.
c'est pas cool. Okay. <rire> Vous avez à peu près compris euh, ce que Peter euh, venait de dire tout à l'heure par rapport euh, à ce que M. Becker euh, a, a présenté, c'est-à-dire quelles sont les opportunités qu'on peut trouver, quels sont les avantages euh, de l'intelligence artificielle dans le domaine de la santé et puis euh, comment est-ce que l'intelligence artificielle peut aider au traitement des patients et la confiance que peut avoir euh, le patient par rapport euh, au traitement. Et surtout, euh, au deuxième niveau, il a, il a donné aussi trois approches, c'est-à-dire comment euh, appliquer euh, cette intelligence artificielle dans l'administration, euh, dans la santé. Et puis, euh, il y a aussi euh, l'engagement des citoyens et, et surtout des patients par rapport à ça. Et puis, euh, les diagnostics aujourd'hui, donc, euh, il faut nécessairement faire confiance à l'intelligence artificielle. Donc, euh, quelque, pour euh, le résultat que nous obtenons euh, par rapport dans le domaine de la santé. Donc, euh, en résumé, c'est ça. Je ne sais pas dans la salle s'il y a des gens qui ont euh, deux questions. Donc, euh, on va donner la parole euh, aux... oui, oui, à ceux qui... Euh, le professeur est comme vous. Qui... Bon, D'accord. Il y a le professeur Ekambo qui doit poser euh, la question. Donc, euh, nous donnons la parole au professeur Ekambo et euh, Peter va interpréter la question du professeur Ekambo pour permettre à M. Becker de... <rire> si, si. Et ceux qui sont en ligne, hein, donc euh, si vous me suivez, si vous avez des questions, il n'y a pas de problème. Essayez de, de poser vos questions, s'il vous plaît, si vous en avez. Merci beaucoup, madame la modératrice. Euh... J'ai une question euh, qui porte sur euh, le deuxième point qui a été développé par euh, M. Bert, euh, qui porte sur, euh, je vais essayer de le dire en anglais si je vais y parvenir, comme ça Peter va traduire. <rire> uh, my question about doctor-patient relationship. Doctor-patient relationship. The relations uh, about doctor and Patient. Yes. Okay. Alors, je voudrais lui poser cette question-ci. Euh, depuis euh, que les, les spécialistes de la communication se sont associés à ceux de la médecine dans la pratique de soins et dans la vision de guérir, on a ressenti un besoin de faire accompagner les patients par leur environnement familial. Parce que M. Peter a également parlé de l'environnement. Et ils ont sorti une sorte de principe, ceux de la communication, qui euh, se formule comme suite, que pour bien soigner un patient, il faut également soigner son environnement. Alors, je voudrais euh, que M. Euh, Becker nous précise un peu. Pour les patients, ce n'est pas un problème. Il a fait sa liste, il y a l'imagerie, il y a le checking, il y a la médecine précision. C'est sur le corps du patient qui est malade, ce n'est pas un problème. Mais pour soigner la relation entre le patient et sa famille, son environnement, pendant qu'il est encore malade ou quand il sera guéri, comment va intervenir précisément l'intelligence artificielle Merci beaucoup. Euh, je prends le premier ou un deuxième Deuxième question. question ouais. Merci beaucoup. Euh, merci beaucoup à M. Baker pour sa présentation, qui est une très belle présentation et surtout en matière d'application. Je suis médecin. Ma question euh, est informaticien médical. Donc, ma question, c'est beaucoup plus, euh, vu que vous développez une application, vous parlez de la confiance à l'intelligence artificielle. Ma question, c'est à quel moment exactement interviennent les utilisateurs finaux Ça veut dire les médecins et les patients dans le processus de développement de l'application de l'intelligence artificielle à partir du moment qu'on sait qu'à un moment donné, même le concepteur n'arrive pas à expliquer le résultat. Donc, quel, à quel moment interviennent ces utilisateurs-là Merci. 
Il y a d'autres questions ou euh, on va alors euh, Peter Il y a une question. Une autre dimension. Une autre dimension, c'est euh, la collaboration entre les médecins. Euh, Est-ce que. Alors, il y a des plateformes hein, collaboratives, euh, de temps, effectivement, de, 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 à des à des médecins d'interagir de, de avec d'autres euh, sur, sur des cas. Sur des cas. Et, et donc, euh, la question qui peut se poser ici, c'est est-ce que l'IA intervient dans ces, dans ces, euh, ces domaines-là et jusqu'à quel point Jusqu'à quel point Alors, Peter. Essayez d'interpréter pour euh, M. Pierre. Great. Uh, merci à tous. Uh, so we have three questions. Uh, so the first one is on doctor-patient relationship. And the point here is that most often than not, some of these tools are actually centered on the patient, like diagnostics and all those things are really centered on the patient's medical conditions, his body and all those stuff. Uh, he points out that it's important to always take into account uh, the patient and the environment. Uh, the patient and obviously the environment. Here the environment uh, encompasses the family and other environmental factors, right? So uh, where, what is the role of AI in establishing this kind of uh, relationship Uh, between uh, in, in establishing this relationship between doctors and patients where it takes into account the patient's environment. I don't know if that, 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 that is quite clear. So, so that, that's the first one. Is it, should I go, jump to the second question or you like to take a shot on the first one? Yeah, maybe just very quickly. Uh, yes. um, there, you can, one could say a lot about um, patient and uh, uh, doctor relationship, but um, as far as I understood, you also said for the patient, it's not a problem to use AI or the patients don't have problems when the doctor uses AI. But this, I doubt. <laughs> Uh, not necessarily that. It was like saying that it is important, not, not the patient has a problem, but it is important to take into account the environment where the patient finds him, him or herself, right? Uh, the family and also the other environmental factors yes. in the quest to build these kind of relationships. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, there is not a, a rule or something or not a, a formal procedure how to, to, to use or how to implement AI in this context. But of course, I think it is, it is uh, important to take into account the, the whole environment, yeah. the, the family and, and, and all the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the colleagues. And um, so, um, because they um, form also the, uh, the background concerning expectations of what this is all about. And does the person uh, um, trust the advice of the doctor or the advice of the machine, actually? <laughs> so that's uh, quite a, a different thing. And it's, of course, it makes a difference when you come home and say your people to your people, there was a machine who diagnosed me cancer. Or if you say the doctor said it might be cancer, but there needs to be more um, 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 more research or more consultations about this. So I think it's it's a very important thing. But of course, um, this is the first uh, um, incident that I think about this actually, and that's, so that's a good uh, that's a, a, a good um, input. Um, influence here to, to make me think about this, of course, yes, thank you. Ouais. C'est une excellente question et euh, elle n'a pas pensé à cette, cette farté que tu viens de euh, mettre sur l'étape, donc oui, c'est super important de prendre en compte euh, l'environnement, les, les familles, dans les conceptions et les designs de tout ce type d'IoT. Uh, in the, for the second question, coming from a medical uh, scientist or student, a medical scientist, okay. So he, he, he was asking a question around when, okay, uh, that's quite straightforward. So when do 
patients or when the users, the users of some of these AI tools, right, come in in the design of AI solutions? Oh, yeah. That's a very good question and that's also a topic that is a very uh, at the heart of what we are doing at the Institute um, because usually patients come in in this process very late. So when the program is already finished and uh, then um, let's see how patients uh, use it and how they think of it. And we think, of course, this is way too late. It needs to, patients need to be involved from the beginning, from the start. They need to, to be included in this consultation process. And um, all the needs of the patients need to be respected from, from, from early on. And, uh, and, and there, um, in our institute, we use different uh, methods, actually, to ensure this or to, to, to experiment with this. Because usually, um, or, or currently, this is not the usual case um, that patients are involved very early on. But I absolutely agree, they need to, do, they need to be in, included very early. Oui, donc la, la réponse, euh, je pense que c'est un petit peu clair, euh, c'est plutôt, en fait, plus pas, euh, c'est ça les points, les souvent, euh, souvent, les usa, euh, usage, usagers, les patients et tout ça, ils viennent souvent vers la fin. Et euh, c'est pas, pas optimal, et normalement c'est mieux de leur mettre même en avance euh, dans les designs de tout ce type de, 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 de UT. Et euh, pour que j'ajoute quelque chose, I wanted to add some stuff, uh, saying that, I mean, there are so many tools that can uh, be implemented in the design phases, right? where we have uh, citizens participation, right, or in consultation, citizens participation or collective intelligence can be used. Uh, en fait, j'ai parlé des faits qu'on peut utiliser uh, les techniques comme l'intelligence collective, voilà, uh, les consultations plutôt ouvertes. Uh, il y a pas mal de techniques uh, dans les designs, dans toutes les phases, the uh, design and also implementation of two set type the 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 UT because what we observe uh, not only in the health sector is that sometimes um, you know tools are done and then we want them to quickly use it which is not optimal you know yes. yeah. yeah and I think the third question was about uh, um, platforms where doctors communicate can collaborate like you're talking about collaboration of medical officers. Uh, in platforms on special medical cases, mm -hmm. uh, when, how, 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 when, 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 how do we boost that, and uh, to what extent should we use that? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that's 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 a good question. Um, um, I think th this is a very uh, important because communication among doctors or collaboration among doctors is is usually. Uh, a complicated thing. It's it's mostly not enough co collaboration, and there should be more. And that's a good question. How can we support this? Um, I think, of course, um, um, by giving the right incentives uh, and to, to make them uh, think about it, and of course to um, provide their uh, practices with uh, the, um, the te te of course the technical uh, equipment and also the, the knowledge how to use it and how to um, make it uh, usable for, for their patients. I think uh, that's uh, very quickly what comes to mind. <laughs> Ouais. Donc, en fait, je pense que c'est un peu clair. C'est important pour collaborer entre les medical officers euh, sur ce euh, volet. En, en fait, il y a plein, plein d'exemples que je peux donner euh, sur ce sujet. Euh, par exemple, on fait un diagnostic, donc c'est quelqu'un que je connais, un diagnostic qui était donné par un médical à un officier. Et en fait, il a dit que les personnes ont un cancer en particulier. Et en fait, après consultation avec deux, euh, deux, experts, deux experts, ils ont dit non, en fait, c'était une réelle forme d'anomalie, mais ce n'est pas un cancer. You know? euh, donc, c'est important pour avoir ce type de collaboration et il a pu aussi jouer un rôle. Je vais vous donner un exemple de le fait qu'un médecin officer peut juste donner un diagnostic diagnostic sur son connaissance. 
and probably leveraging on other other expects to be like, no, this is just a small anomaly and it's not really uh, what was being diagnosed initially. Yeah. Okay, you have compris à peu près uh, <laughs> ce que M. Becker a dit. Merci beaucoup à M. Becker. Nous allons uh, maintenant passer uh, aux des intervenants qui sont en ligne. J'espère que il y a Serene et Oscock. Vous m'entendez? Vous êtes en ligne déjà? Ils vont intervenir ici sur. Uh, les robots domestiques, parce que j'essaie de, tra de traduire un peu en français. J'espère qu'ils sont en ligne. Je suis en train de parler. Vous pouvez présenter votre travail. Je suis Asgaz de Istanbul Culture University, de New Media and Communication Department. Je vous présente en tant que de mes collègues pour l'assistant du professeur Ceren Bilgici. Notre papier est appelé comme « Human Artificial Intelligence Enable Domestic Robots » interaction in the context of data surveillance and privacy. So first of all, uh, we would like to very honored to be part of this organization. So uh, thank you to uh, organization committee and Professor Allen. Um, so let's start the presentation. Uh, so let's focus in our study. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I have to do this, yeah. So the study's primary aim to evaluate robot vacuum cleaners in the context of uh, data surveillance and privacy uh, based on human AI interaction. So robot vacuum cleaners that exhibit an autonomous behavior are the first service robots that individuals began to uh, use widely in their homes. So from this point of view, the research aims to reveal users' perspectives and feelings about their relationship uh, with the robots and to demonstrate their thoughts and data protection, uh, surveillance and privacy issues in this uh, interaction. So, I'm sorry because of the technique. So, so um, I'm sorry. So, domestic robots developed in the line with the developments in human uh, robot interaction. Um, studies have started to find a place in the modern household and have enabled many users to accept them as a part of their daily lives. So moreover, we increased this type of these robots with different function in human uh, environments, robot interaction have also increased significantly. So in this context, tra uh, transforming these artificial intelligence based devices into part of individuals daily lives has brought data surveillance and privacy concerns. So um, we can, um, I'm sorry, the, this concept uh, of surveillance can be examined in two ways. So first, its means can be explained in encrypted information used to control individuals' behavior that is distributed among the individuals themselves. The second meaning can be expressed as surveillance carried out to establish authority individuals. So, um, about the research questions. Sorry. In this context, uh, we start in question of this uh, research are as follows. First of all, we are prominent element in human robot interaction with domestic vacuum cleaners. And the second one, we are prominent elements of data surveillance in human vacuum cleaner interaction. Mm -hmm. And the last one, what are the prominent elements of the privacy in human robot vacuum cleaner interaction? So um, this study uses a semi-structured um, in-depth interview uh, to convey the user's motivation, feelings, and thoughts regarding to robot vacuum cleaners applications. Within the scope of these interviews, 10 open-ended questions were directed to participants to understand six demographic characteristics, 12 robot vacuum usage practices, and um, experiences with robot, clean, robot vacuum cleaners used uh, to ensure detailed um, discussion of the subject. So in the context of this uh, convenience sampling method, in-depth interview were conducted um, with 12 participants, aged 25 to 56, uh, who are early adapters of vacuum cleaners in Turkey. So uh, they, are, uh, they, they were uh, determined using the curation uh, sampling method. So um, we can, so we can um, share result and discussion. Uh, 
So um, now, while I am talking uh, about the general result of this research, you can also present the uh, participant answer on the screen. So you can see uh, on the screen them answers. So in general, um, I, we could say we, most participants consider it's positive that robot vacuum cleaners have human speech and voice. So some participants find it scary that his, it has a human voice. As you see, a time research participant use the robot vacuum cleaners with the sound turn on. But uh, on the other hand, um, two participants use with the use with it um, sound turn off. So it seems that almost all participants named uh, their vacuum cleaners. Um, also, the majority of these names are female names. For example, Katya, Maria, Hediye. It means in uh, gift in Turkish. So. And besides, some names come from animated characters. For example, Wally, Rosie. Uh, you can see them named um, answers on the screen, by the way. So um, all participants use a female voice, uh, use the robot vacuum cleaner. It seems that um, many do not know whether there's an option to use male voice in the installation of the robot vacuum cleaner. So uh, some participants stated they, that their robot vacuum cleaners have no other sound option. Um, it means uh, it seems that some participants find it sexist and criticize that the robot vacuum cleaner is defined as a female voice at the opening. I don't understand. I'm sorry. Hello. 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 I don't have a presentation. Uh, you you can see I, I can't um okay I can hear it. Uh, en fait, euh, en fait, je crois qu'elle a qu'elle a mal à vous entendre. Mais est-ce que si vous vous, vous l'entendez, elle peut continuer, c'est ça? Oui, oui, elle peut continuer. Oui. Je vais devoir me débrouiller. Uh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so. Um, okay, so. Um, where we are? Okay. You, you are on the result? So, uh, yes, okay. All participants use a female voice, I said. Uh, um, and it's cr criticized and is find a sexist. So this is a... Um, this is important, and I can say this one. I'm sorry, it's all confused. My okay, I'm sorry. Okay, um, why the participants are concerned about the intelligent devices have emerged is since that users behave more tolerant than vacuum cleaners. For example, participant 10 says. Uh, our data sh is shared, but although it's generally un uncomfortable, but it's not a specific robot vacuum cleaner, so it's okay. So uh, most participants state the robot vacuum creates a feeling being watched in their homes. So participants seven said that said about that the camera works triggers um, this. So he um, it, it can be you can see every part of this our, uh, house. So now come and feel not being watched. Uh, so it's not like the, that when you are work, working. So uh, when even you, you are a stationary, you can censor it with detected from stretch. So um, it turns out the participants are since more innocent regarding surveillance compared to other smart devices. For example, a uh, participant five is, uh, says in our message, in our television, in our tablets, in our computer, uh, on our phone, in our um, phone conversation is a robot seems more harmless. So um, for almost a uh, participant, the functionality, functionality uh, expect the robot vacuum cleaners is since more important than data privacy and privacy concerns. For example, um, participant seven says, uh, I'm getting nervous because we are completely in the hands in the system. However, I feel like not uh, continue my life without the robot. So I don't, I, I don't care. Um, so, I'm sorry. Um, 
when the participants were asked to um, describe their robots vacuum cleaners in the world, the titles that emerged were as follows, like convenience, you can see on the screen, and uh, convenience, practical, uh, effective, fast, procedures. So it seems that almost all, uh, all of the preferred expression are positive expression, but uh, only one expression is negative uh, in the preferred expression as slow. So, So, uh, okay, this is, so um, it turns out uh, the, uh, out of the participants are seen uh, as more innocent regarding surveillance um, compared to other smart devices. Um, and repetitive elements in expression preferred by the participant are as follows, helper, clever, uh, fast, practical, like this. So about the conclusion, um, it says that the participant approached the robot vacuum cleaners in the um, questioning um, manner in the context of surveillance and privacy. So the fact that the robot vacuum cleaners is a tool in the house and pro uh, provides the function in the private area is seen as more innocent than other issues. So compared to other innovative tools, it seems that the participants are more tolerant toward uh, to the robot vacuum cleaners. So we could say that the participant humanized the robot vacuum cleaners. It means talking to a vacuum cleaner is a standard action. So. Uh, the fact that the participants are in the irresistible uh, relationship with the robot vacuum cleaners uh, creates an obstacle with uh, obstacle uh, to being a critical of it. So, in addition, the fact that they um, they use an expression such as "label" when describing the robot vacuum cleaners show that they have a positive feeling uh, beyond their reservation. Okay. So, um, thank you for your time. Um, uh, for your time and your attention. Without uh, taking too much of your time, we, that's all we have to say. I'm sorry for the technical uh, problem because uh, I, I realize now uh, I shared the wrong uh, presentation. So it's um, a little complicated. I'm sorry for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um... Uh, je préfère que uh, Karen intervienne aussi. Comme ça, euh, Peter va essayer d'interpréter aussi euh, non, tout le monde. C'est parce... bon, bon Oui, c'est la même étude. Ok, d'accord. Euh, Peter Good. Thanks to both of you for the presentation um, on that, uh, on, on your paper on uh, human artificial intelligence enabled domestic robot inter interactions in the context of data surveillance and privacy. Uh, the robot vacuum cleaner uh, uses example. So I'll just do a quick summary of your presentation in French so that participants can um, have a French version of what you've talked about uh, pre assembly okay? So, uh, bon, je suis en français. Uh, en fait, le papier, c'était pour évaluer, uh, évaluer les perceptions du des, des humains sur <laughs> so, ce sujet autour de l'interaction homme-robot les hommes-robots et leur cas usage c'est plutôt un aspirateur intelligent ok donc il y avait les aspirateurs intelligents et l'idée c'est pour voir est-ce que les participants les participants les participants sont plutôt susceptibles au sujet des euh, données privées euh, les surveillances ou pas du tout euh, en fait, les, donc ils ont fait pas mal d'enquêtes euh, ménages, de quelques nombres de participants, et à plus de 90%, euh, il y a, je pense que c'est qu'une qui avait un sentiment un peu négatif, mais plus de 90% pensent que euh, cet euh, aspirateur intelligent, euh, c'est super intelligent, c'est rapide, c'est ça aide euh, et c'est plus euh, confortable et pratique. Toi. Donc euh, pour eux, même le fait que des fois les aspirateurs, il y a les voix, reconnaît les voix, des fois il y a les caméras et tout ce genre de choses. Pour eux, ça leur pose pas question sur 
où leur, comment leurs données est utilisée, euh, que, comment c'est stocké et, et tout ce type de sujet. Donc, la plupart des gens pensent que euh, cette robot intelligente c'est plutôt confortable, il, il y a une interaction comme si c'est un humain. Donc, pour eux, tout va bien, mais le sujet des données privées et le surveillance n'est pas du tout un, 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 un sujet. Donc, en fait, ça, c'était les résumés de leur étude. En fait, les perceptions, c'était plutôt positif autour des robots intelligence et euh, les sujets des données privées, pas, ça n'a pas choqué <rire> les participants. Ah, yes. D'accord. C'est-à-dire vous avez suivi tout à l'heure que, que Ren et Oscock, ils ont, euh, elles ont plutôt euh, parlé de l'évaluation, c'est-à-dire de la perception après quelques études qu'ils ont menées sur terrain, plus de 90%, ils ont constaté qu'il n'y avait pas de problème sur la perception de, de caméras, de robots intelligents qui, qui réagissent pratiquement comme l'homme. Donc, de ce côté-là, donc ils ont très bien perçu euh, en intelligence artificielle les, les robots et, et, et tous les autres appareils utilisés dans, dans les domaines de l'intelligence artificielle. Alors, le 90%, ils ont répondu qu'il n'y avait pas de problème pour l'utilisation de, de ces outils-là. Alors, euh, s'il y a des questions dans la salle ou il y a d'autres qui sont en ligne qui peuvent poser des questions. So, so we take in questions from the floor ah, based on your presentation. Oui, Merci beaucoup. Euh, J'espère, Peter, que vous n'allez pas vous fatiguer de mes questions. Euh, je voudrais d'abord que vous puissiez me traduire un, un mot que j'ai vu là-bas, euh, écrit « real reliable ». Comment vous traduisez ça en français ?« Reliable hein? ».« Fiable oui. ».« Fiable oui. ». D'accord. Alors, voici euh, ma question. Euh, elle porte sur la conclusion de cette étude. Euh, lorsque les usagers estiment que dans euh, la possession de ces robots et dans leur utilisation, les questions euh, liées aux données personnelles interviennent peu. Euh, J'ai comme l'impression euh, que cette réponse venant des usagers n'est pas euh, totalement vraie. Parce okay. que ici, j'ai comme l'impression que nous ne prenons pas en considération les métadonnées. Il n'y a pas que les questions relatives à la fiabilité, à la performance des outils, finalement à l'évaluation de la performance des ingénieurs, des équipementiers qui comptent, mais aussi, il y a cette question de métadonnées. Je vais donner juste un petit exemple. Nous avons euh, notre aspirateur dans les différentes pièces euh, de l'université. Euh, nous aurons euh, des pièces qui sont très propres, où les aspirateurs n'ont pratiquement rien à faire. Aujourd'hui comme hier, on peut s'absenter du bureau pendant 2-3 jours, ce n'est pas un problème. Il y aura d'autres pièces qui seront très sales, où les aspirateurs auront beaucoup de travail. Mais cette différence-là, elle est déjà significative. C'est que soit les pièces qui sont très propres, parce qu'elles ne sont pas fréquentées, et si nous revenons à l'université par exemple, on peut dire ce sont des pièces réservées juste aux activités de recherche, où les gens ne viennent pas nombreux, et d'autres pièces qui sont très fréquentées, comme les salles de cours, qui ne sont pas restées très propres pendant que l'on utilise les robots. Et ces métadonnées, qui ne sont pas des données directes, perceptibles, ne sont pas prises en compte par les personnes qui ont été conviées à pouvoir euh, évaluer ces aspirateurs comme objet. Je ne sais pas si j'étais clair. Oui, oui, c'était clair. Euh, 
C'est juste ce temps pour regarder un peu le, le, le sujet. Est-ce que c'est quai pour la maison ou, ou dans les bureaux Parce qu'ils ont dit domestique. Mmh. Donc c'est vraiment. Voilà. Donc c'est un autre. Et même si on prend la maison, ça peut être le salon. Les gens vont toucher. Le salon sera un peu plus malpropre. Ouais. Les gens vont toucher. Mmh. Toutes les pièces de salle, les, les, les chambres des enfants, par rapport aux chambres des parents. Oui. Yes. Uh, bon, j'ai traduit ça vite and then, uh, pour ne pas oublier cette partie. So, uh, let, let, me, let me just, uh, I, I hope you can hear me. Let me just have a quick, I'm going to translate uh, the question on the floor to, to, to you. Um, what, what the, the, the claim here is that uh, your, your participants or the insights that you have uh, obtained from the participant might not be the well captured, right? Uh, given that, I mean, they all seem quite positive with one uh, negative sentiment, right? And the, the issue here could be in line with the design. Okay, one part of it has to do with the design of how these, um, the questions were done, right? Could lead to these sentiments. Uh, the point that has been made here is that it is important to capture the metadata associated with the use of these vacuum cleaners, right? So the metadata could involve um, whether these uh, vacuum cleaners or robots were used in different rooms, right, within the home or the location, right? And uh, there are cases where these, uh, these robots, or there are some rooms that are highly used compared to the other rooms, and there could be a possibility that the rooms might not be cleaned uh, in, that, in that form, right? Or might not be that efficient, right? So depending on the, the, the bedroom, the sitting room, and all those stuff, uh, you may have different perception on how the outputs of these kind of, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, robots, right? So uh, probably there's still a bit of work to be done in this research, and uh, the professor here says that uh, you might have missed capturing the full perception of, 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 of that, yes. I don't know if you wanted to. Re you want to react to it before we take the next question. Um, first of all, thank you for your question. Uh, I don't think uh, if I uh, understand wrong, please uh, let me know, okay? <laughs> because I, I'm not sure. Uh, because uh, the uh, voice is very slow for me, and um, I I can't hear all of them. So I'm okay. sorry for all of this, but I, I'm trying to answer. Um, I think uh, you ask um, uh, domestic robots for uh, cleaning, for uh, just doing some things, but uh, house, house things. But uh, now uh, our, for our research, people uh, think that they are like human, uh, human. But um, our data, uh, our results about our results, uh, we saw that uh, the people um, think that if the machine with uh, AA, uh, if uh, have a human more uh, humanized um, special things or um, like uh, talking or uh, cleaning, and um, when you have something, when you say something, it's uh, when if is answer or something like humanized uh, is uh, makes them people um, think them uh, like they are more uh, look like human or um, there are a lot of motivation uh, I think but uh, for our research we just um, trying to understand uh, try to understand um, why people um, think like this and um, if they have any concern about data, data surveillance or privacy, uh, and um, if um, this uh, concern um, occurred, um, if what what is uh, this? Why is this important? So um, we we just try to make it. Uh, we just trying to fight it, but. Um, 
So I don't know uh, if it's answer or <laughs> for you. Yeah, it takes part of the the, the question. Sa, sa, sa réponse c'est c'est plutôt des faits. C'est bon. La la réponse était plutôt les faits que les participants pensent que le fait d'avoir euh, un robot qui qui parle dans qui parle avec eux, qui qui leur voit, qui comprend leurs émotions et tout ça, c'est comme un humain, un petit humain euh, avec eux. Donc euh, c'est c'est pas que les tâches qui leur c'est pas que les usages des robots, mais c'est juste le fait qu'il y a sept niveaux d'interaction, ça leur gêne pas euh, où sont stockées leurs données, les surveillances et toute cette partie des données privées, ça leur choque pas. Et l'étude euh, en tant pour question pourquoi ça leur choque pas, euh, est-ce qu'il y a d'autres choses à faire? pour assurer que les gens prennent conscience autour des données privées et tout ce genre de choses. Ouais. Ça, ça touche un petit peu. Ouais. Ok, that, that seems quite ok. We'll take the last question. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions? Yes. We'll take another question from the floor. Merci. Euh, merci pour la présentation. Ma question rejoint un peu euh, la question pré précédente du professeur. À la conclusion, elle dit que les utilisateurs sont plutôt satisfaits de la gestion des données personnelles. Moi, je reviens au niveau de la méthodologie. Parce que eh, vous avez choisi uniquement des personnes qui utilisent les robots. Et vous n'avez pas échantillonné des personnes qui n'utilisent pas les robots. Et déjà, le choix d'acheter un robot eh, qui coûte cher... Déjà, ça veut dire que la personne, en achetant le robot, a, a déjà fait un choix de céder ses données plus ou moins en griffe euh, dans le cadre de l'utilisation. Et comme elle n'a pas une idée sur ceux qui n'ont pas acheté le robot, et pourquoi ils ne l'ont pas acheté, ça devient un peu délicat de faire une conclusion pour moi. Et qu'est-ce qu'elle en passe par rapport à cette méthodologie Merci. D'accord, je vais peut-être euh, accorder une petite minute euh, à, à Karen pour répondre à, à la question parce que les temps nous fait vraiment défaut. Nous allons prendre euh, en ligne aussi euh, euh, M. Sabin et Mme Soundé, professeur, qui va intervenir sur, euh, euh, sur l'intelligence artificielle à propos euh, de la protection des enfants et, et, les, et M. Sabin qui vont intervenir en même temps parce que après nous allons euh, prendre les questions ensemble, c'est-à-dire pour essayer de, de raccourcir un peu ce que nous sommes en train de faire. Alors peut-être accorder une petite minute pour, euh, de précision euh, par rapport à la question de tout à l'heure. Oui, yeah, no, 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 c'est une question sur les méthodologies. Je vois que c'est plus comme une suggestion. Je vois comme si c'est une suggestion sur um, votre méthodologie. Parce que vous vous focalisez sur les participants qui ont acheté ce genre de robots robot, uh, I mean, vacuum uh, cleaners, right? Um, the question from the floor, which is much more like a suggestion, is to rather look at Oh, the cases where people uh, needed vacuum cleaners and then they decided not even to purchase these vacuum cleaners, right? That, that, uh, because if the person didn't purchase it, probably these individuals did consider the issue of our data privacy and surveillance, right? So uh, the design of the methodology might be biased towards those who really needed vacuum cleaners. So that's why you might have everybody saying that we are satisfied with the work. So there's a question on the methodology and the design on how you collect data. Interviewing people who need vacuum cleaners, who decide not to go for it, and that might lead to other conclusions that might have not been captured, okay? So, yeah, we'll move to the next uh, speakers. So it's just a suggestion to really look at the methodology. So, our next speaker. D'accord, on va prendre alors le euh, professeur Soudé, qui va intervenir sur euh, l'intelligence artificielle à propos de la protection des enfants, et M. Sabin et Capo, euh, Capo Chichi, qui vont intervenir en même temps. Et puis, euh, Peter va faire le résumé en français de, de ces deux. Donc, 
C'est écrit. C'est soudé. Oui, oui. Soudé. OK. So, our next speaker will be uh, Mr. Ensudé uh, from Ebo uh, State University. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Mrs. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, Mrs. Ensudé. Sorry. And then the next one will be uh, Sa Sahadi Sabine. Sabine, and then uh, so we'll take this presentation uh, in that form. So let's start with the first one from Ebony State University. D'abord, Professor Soudé. In today, you can you can you can present. Please allow me to share my screen. Okay, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, Hello. we can hear you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Hello. 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 Can I start my presentation? Yes. Uh, yes, but um, okay. I'm just take it. Can I share my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Once more, good morning, everyone. I'm Professor Ifeunwa Nsude, Ebony State University, Abakaleke, Nigeria. I'm glad to be in your midst. Before my presentation, pure, I have a question for this audience. And my question is, if the society fails to protect the child, who takes over from us? This rhetoric question will lead us to my topic entitled, Enhancing Child Protection in Nigeria Through Artificial Intelligence. Every human, yes. every human has fundamental human rights, which are constitutionally guaranteed. For example, we have rights to life, right to life, right to education, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and so many rights that have been captured by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Children are in addition to universal human rights, guaranteed specific rights as stipulated in UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. For example, they have rights to life, right to education, right to good nutrition, right to clean water, and so on. Because these rights are very many. That was why UNICEF decided to package all these rights of children into four baskets of rights, namely right to survival, right to development, right to protection, which is where we are today, and right to participation. So this paper will be discussing right to protection. Then UNICEF also, uh, in Nigeria, for instance, Child Rights Act, 2003 is the law that guarantees the rights of all children. So far, 24 out of 36 states in Nigeria have adopted the Child Rights Act as a state law. Ironically, even in those states that adopted Child Rights Law as a state law, Child, the child is denied of his rights, abused in so many ways. They are languishing in poverty and dying of hunger in most places. Despite universal ratification of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, millions of children around the world continue to be left behind and their rights abused and denied. I have two pictures here. The first one, according to NSPCC, 
which is National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. And mm -hmm. it has um, over 58,000 children identified to be needing protection from abuse. And today, the figure has increased to 404,310. You can imagine. Now, as we talk about um, child rights, child rights as enshrined in the Constitution, some researchers are bothered. Now that we are living in a digital era, what happens to the child online? So on March 2, 2021, 2021, the Committee on the Rights of the Child released general comment number 25, 2021, on children's rights in relation to the digital environment. Children use AI system directly or indirectly. When I say directly, I mean those products they use whereby AI is embedded in them. For example, we talk about the toys they use, the video and the video games, so many of them. So in so doing, children use AI systems directly. Then indirectly, it's just like what my colleague said about um, uh, how AI can be used in the hospital. I equally uh, conducted a study there and see that AI can be used for medical diagnosis, even yeah. for dispensing of drugs and so on. So mm -hmm. children wow. are benefiting from all these services indirectly. Excuse me, Professor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the introduction and the motivation is very, very clear. I was wondering whether we can have four minutes to summarize the key insights on, on, on the world. Wow. <laughs> it's not easy, <laughs> but I, I know you can do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me rush. You say four minutes? Yes, if that would be great. Wow. Okay. All right. Now, let me quickly rush through what I have. Then under conceptual clarifications. You know, in Nigeria, for instance, AI is still moving at a snail pace. That's why I normally, to first of all, conceptualize the terms. For example, last week, when I was discussing with uh, my colleague, I told her that uh, I'll be presenting a paper at this conference. He, she asked me, I now told her the topic. He said, ah, what do people mean by this artificial intelligence? I so, said, a very well-educated person. So that justify why I have decided to conceptualize the terms, AI, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. And I want to point out that the two of them uh, are interconnected. AI is just like a, an umbrella word, Machine learning is um, a component of AI that handles specific tasks. Deep learning is also another subcategory of uh, machine learning. Then child protection. Um, let's move on since I have uh, more than, uh, less than four minutes. Then objectives. I decided to uh, outline objectives, uh, the uh, four objectives uh, just to guide us because this is a qualitative study to discuss how the mainstream media can create awareness on the use of AI for child protection, explore how parents and children can contribute to child protection in the era of AI. In fact, naturally, parents are supposed to take the lead in protecting the child. But in this case, ignorantly, some parents expose their identity, the identity of their children online through sharenting. Every little thing they will uh, snap and uh, forward mm -hmm. it or post to the internet and all that. Then um, I reviewed some empir empirical works. So it is um, qualitative research to know what authors said about um, AI and uh, child protection. Now, the summary of uh, the 
uh, reviewed uh, studies is that all of them know that uh, AI is very beneficial and pointed out that for us to reap the benefit of AI, we must have to address the challenges. And again, I noticed from the results of those empirical research that um, none of them really address AI and child protection. The only one that addressed it did not address it uh, fully, which formed a gap. There is a lacuna there, which actually this work has failed. Then I have two theories, uh, two, one theory agenda set in theory, propounded by Marcos and Shaw in 1972. And uh, that theory is just telling us uh, about the media, that whatever the media looks at or portrays as important, other members of the audience uh, looks at that thing as being significant. That's why the bottom line of that theory says that the media cannot tell you what to think, but what to think about. So it is related to this work because if the media um, tell people about AI, how AI can be used for child protection, I think people will be interested to know what to do. Then the other one I used was uh, oh, a Hello. Yes. Okay. You have one minute. To okay. 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 Let me use the let, let me use the one minute. Yeah. AI and child protection. Children must be specially protected, ensuring their rights are guaranteed as priority, no matter the circumstances. AI must be grounded in human centric designs. AI inherent risks must be properly vetted. AI facilities. AI facilitates um, AI facilitates child protection by processing huge amount of information at a great speed, making decision very very easy. AI can dictate when a child might be at risk of exploitation. AI can also support law enforcement agents in investigating, preventing, and facilitating the prosecution of a wide range of forms of sexual exploitation and harassment. AI also has its challenges, such as sharenting by some parents, low awareness creation by the mainstream media, ignorance of most security operatives in the use of AI application online, among others. I therefore make the following recommendations. One, the mainstream media should continue to create awareness on the use of AI for child protection. And more scholarly work should be done in that area. Parents should monitor the type of information their children are exposed to through the AI technologies they use, and also avoid exposing their children's privacy online through sharenting. Secre uh, security operatives should undergo regular trainings on the use of AI applications in protecting the child. Tech industry should design AI-friendly applications that are human-centric in child protection online. Nigeria government should ensure proper implementation of child rights, which are already enshrined in the constitution. Thank you for listening. Many thanks, Prof. Uh, this, this is an excellent presentation. You've hit on a very key important uh, area, which is obviously on children and children's rights. And we see a lot of advances in technology, especially AI, and how it is going to impact uh, children's health, mental health, and uh, online violence, uh, and all those stuff. So, uh, there is really a great, uh, so much work that has to be done, and most of the recommendations that you've done, you've pointed out, are very, very important. Uh, the French Development Agency is also very committed to that. I know that uh, the University of New York Governance Lab uh, worked on responsible data for children. Responsible data for children. You can have it online. It's responsible data for government uh, for children. Uh, which is an excellent initiative which uh, touches on some of the things that you have uh, highlighted. Uh, happy to com continue the conversation uh, with you on, on, on that. Uh, I'll contact the organizers and then reach out to you to
to continue this conversation. So many thanks. Uh, we will have the two speakers. Uh, so the speaker, I think it's from Harry and uh, uh, Seven Gilbert uh, to give the uh, talk. I think you have a maximum of five minutes to, to give uh, the, the talk on that. C'est-à-dire nous allons prendre Sabin et Gilbert pour cinq minutes. Togo. D'accord, merci. Merci beaucoup. Je vais essayer d'être euh, bref. Oui, oui. Si je peux partager directement mon écran pour aller vite. Est-ce que vous pouvez me donner la main pour oui, mon veux. écran? Si, si. Partage d'écran. D'accord. Partager. Partager cela là-dessus. Voilà. Je vais aller vite. Partie du début. Voilà. Donc, je, je, moi, je m'appelle Sabin Sohaï et euh, je suis enseignant-chercheur à l'Université de Lomé. Je, je suis à Isika, l'Institut des sciences de l'information et de la communication. J'ai travaillé avec euh, le docteur Gilbert Capotiti, qui est à CEPCO, au Bénin. Et ensemble, depuis un moment, nous réfléchissons sur euh, la création des plateformes et des applications qui vont aider dans l'inclusion numérique en Afrique. CERCO est un véritable laboratoire pour ceux qui ont peut-être visité Cotonou. Ils savent qu'ils ont une technologie suffisamment avancée sur des questions endogènes concernant les préoccupations de, de la technologie en Afrique. Donc, nous essayons par les problématiques de l'IA qui peuvent aider à résorber un certain nombre de problèmes, d'aider de, à pouvoir accompagner les primo-apprenants dans le numérique pour qu'ils puissent être au point et aussi les accompagner dans divers aspects pour qu'ils puissent aussi comprendre le fonctionnement de, de l'IA. Nous, on travaille pour peut-être aider à éclore des mentalités, mais à utiliser plus les nouvelles technologies euh, et faire développer un peu quelque part l'Afrique et puis aider sur le plan social. Donc, notre présentation va être structurée en cinq points. Donc, une petite introduction, la présentation de la plateforme, les bénéfices et une conclusion. Rassurez-vous, je vais aller très vite. Hein. Donc, l'IA, tout le monde a défini depuis hier, on a vu que c'est véritablement une technologie de pointe qui peut aider dans tous les domaines. Nous, par rapport à l'inclusion numérique, nous avons plutôt euh, voulu commencer par l'apprentissage avec euh, tout ce que l'IA peut nous proposer dans le déploiement des algorithmes, dans les développements qui peuvent nous permettre d'aller vite et pouvoir euh, combler un peu le, le fossé numérique en, en Afrique et aider à, à socialiser un peu le, le côté technologique qui, quelquefois, est beaucoup plus rébarbatif pour ceux qui n'ont pas été à l'école et qui est peut-être éloigné à ceux qui ne comprennent pas véritablement l'univers de, de la programmation, de l'informatique, de tout ce qu'il y a comme technologie. Donc, les applications, les retombées possibles du numérique ou de l'IA sont véritablement capitalisées pour le continent africain. Et nous n'avons pas les mêmes problèmes qu'en Europe. Nous, nous voulons de l'IA pour nous aider à pouvoir inclure certains qui sont un peu plus éloignés des technologies. Donc, dans cette, ce travail, nous avons voulu commencer, puis en conclusion, je dirais qu'on a une série de réflexions là-dessus, en introduction, je vous l'avais dit. Nous, a, nous avons commencé par travailler sur une application et une plateforme directement, c'est un peu hybride, qu'on appelle Skulu, qui est une application qui va aider eh, à pouvoir étudier à, dans l'apprentissage, qui va prendre en compte des problématiques d'apprentissage. Donc, la plateforme, ça va être quoi? Un robot autonome qui va pouvoir récupérer des informations, qui va tester un, un apprenant tout au début et pouvoir inclure les, 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 ses avancées, ses faiblesses, ses points forts, l'aider dans le, le parcours d'apprentissage qui sera lui. Il sera véritablement un parcours un peu personnalisé et adaptatif, en fait. Donc, les bénéfices... C'est pour que on, on puisse à chaque à chaque euh, apprenant pouvoir lui proposer une formation qui est adaptée à, à ses besoins, à ses préoccupations et aider aussi à créer des ponts entre ceux qui sont avancés, ceux qui ne sont pas, ceux qui ne sont pas. Donc, elle, elle peut être déployée dans les établissements qui à la base pour apprendre directement les technologies 
technologie à la base ou aussi dans les milieux un peu défavorisés tels que dans les milieux où on utilise un peu l'alphabétisation. Donc, les bénéfices de cette plateforme sont énormes et nous avons commencé par, c'est pratiquement, on est, on est en phase de, de ce n'est pas complètement terminé, mais cette, cette plateforme va nous permettre de pouvoir accompagner l'enseignement les, les, dans toute sa dimension adaptative et en prenant en compte les, pr les préoccupations majeures. Donc, la plateforme permet d'apporter aussi aux enseignants des sources complémentaires puisque euh, avec l'IA, comme tout le monde sait, on sera en contact avec des bases de données qui peuvent aussi être utilisées ou être actualisées dans le processus d'apprentissage et être adaptatives par rapport au cursus qu'on proposera. Maintenant, quels sont les points Nous avons commencé à prendre techniquement le, la plateforme pour pouvoir eh, accompagner comme outil pédagogique. Mais techniquement, il y a quand même quelques éléments que nous sommes en train de réfléchir pour pouvoir améliorer. Tout le monde sait que l'IA ne peut pas prendre véritablement en compte eh, ce qu'on appelle les émotions, les sentiments, les causes sociaux. Et ces, éléments, ces points culturels sont très, très importants en Afrique aussi, dans l'univers d'apprentissage que nous avons ici. Donc, c'est des points qui sont en réflexion pour voir comment est-ce qu'on peut aussi faire cet accompagnement-là pour que eh, l'outil soit aussi complet. Ce n'est pas pour remplacer totalement un enseignant, mais qui va aider aussi dans la création des liens, donc dans diverses euh, euh, situations d'apprentissage qui peuvent être des, des situations qu'on va rencontrer avec des groupes spécifiques. Je, je rappelais que notre public, c'était la Vous m'entendez Oui, là, on te reçoit. Bon. L'apprentissage à la base, les groupes sociaux qui n'ont pas accès à la technologie, les, les, les femmes, par exemple, et puis dans les, ceux qui sont véritablement euh, les... les les personnes en, en demande de l'utilisation de, des outils euh, perfectionnés pour pouvoir accompagner le, leur méthodologie. Donc, voilà un peu les éléments améliorés qui vont permettre d'y aller beaucoup plus vite. Donc, en conclusion, je, 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 dis, je disais aussi au début que nous sommes dans la réflexion hein, pour pouvoir créer cette série d'outils en plateforme et en application qui vont aider dans l'inclusion du numérique. Donc, le, 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 le côté apprentissage, ce n'est qu'un début. Et avec ce côté apprentissage, nous pouvons aller dans d'autres sphères qui vont aider dans l'inclusion numérique en Afrique et permettre d'apporter un peu plus de lumière grâce à l'IA. Et on sait que le potentiel existe dans, tout, dans toutes les sphères. Il y aura l'agriculture, il y aura la santé, il y aura le, le côté social de façon beaucoup plus générale. Voilà un peu briefé notre présentation qui est très rapide. En cinq minutes, je ne sais pas si j'ai pratiquement dit des choses essentielles, mais je me suis efforcé à rester dans le temps. Je vous remercie, je suis à disposition pour les questions et euh, les diverses propositions pour pouvoir améliorer si d'autres personnes ont d'autres idées, surtout dans l'inclusion numérique en Afrique, on est preneur. Merci, je vous remercie pour m'avoir donné la parole. Merci beaucoup Sabin, si j'ai bien compris, vous avez travaillé sur une application euh, de la technologie euh, et du numérique en Afrique, alors vous avez mis ça. en place euh, cette, euh, cette application qui s'appelle Sklu c'est-à-dire pour aider aussi les gens qui ne sont pas allés à l'école à bien aussi apprendre les technologies et surtout proposer des aspects qui peuvent aider les enseignants. C'est-à-dire parce que l'intelligence artificielle ne peut pas du coup tout faire. Donc il faut aider et mettre en place les outils pour permettre aux professeurs ou aux enseignants d'aider aussi ceux qui en ont besoin mais qui ne peuvent pas. Alors, euh, les questions vont venir peut-être après, parce que nous allons euh, maintenant la prendre, parce que nous allons prendre des intervenants, euh, Henriette Ognumbéré et puis Henri Osoudi, qui vont intervenir en même temps, et puis nous allons passer euh, aux questions. C'est-à-dire, vous pouvez rester là en attendant qu'on qu puisse peut-être discuter euh, avec les deux autres avant de vous accorder la parole pour répondre aux questions. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Sabin. Alors, euh, la parole est à Henriette Ondjoumbéré et Henri Osoudi qui vont faire leur présentation. Ils sont ensemble, j'espère. Ils sont ensemble. D'accord. Alors, vous avez la parole. Osoudi, Henriette. 
Henri et Henriette. Henri, uh, your microphone is off. Vous avez cinq minutes aussi. Hein? Il essaye de parler, mais c'est le micro. Le micro, pas... c'est lui qui est en train de parler. Je ne sais pas si on peut activer son micro. Oui, c'est activé déjà. Ah. C'est à elle d'abord. Oh, hello, okay. hello. Hello. Tiens, des bidons. Euh, c'est Henriette qui commence. Hein? C'est Henriette qui commence. Vous avez cinq minutes hein, pour présenter. Euh... Oh, malheureusement. Okay. Tiens, des bidons. Les temps vous fait défaut, s'il vous plaît. Tiens, unmute yourself. Okay. Hello, good afternoon, SN participants and colleagues. Uh, please, can you unmute my call? Yes, yes, it's done. It's done. Okay. My name is Chidima Henret Aoumbere from National Open University of Nigeria, Abuja. I co authored this paper with uh, Dr. Henry Osuji, a hydrocytico research fellow resident here in France. Uh, the topic we are about to present, being presented here, is can I please share my slides? Yeah, can yeah, I uh. share my slides? Can I share my slides? Peut partager son slide. Non, non, mais c'est à elle de partager. Hein. Uh, yes, yes, you I can. The yeah. topic. Yes, can I share my slides? Yes. Yeah, the topic we are about presenting here is titled. Artificial intelligence in broadcasting, awareness and perception of government policies by staff of open and distant learning institutions in Nigeria. A case study of EPS policies in now, that is National Open University of Nigeria. Uh, we are taking this paper in two parts. How do auto method and my co-author we finished up? So uh, it is important to say that the essence of good broadcast journalism is to ensure effective and accurate dissemination information to the end users. And we know that the radio and TV, which are unique, can effectively do this. But however, we also thought it twice to say that it is no longer efficient to use only the traditional media in modern society without uh, assisting it with AI. Under introduction, we also looked at the values of AI, how it decreases social, uh, economic uh, inequalities, and how it can be used to effectively communicate government policies. Then we looked at this government policy under review is what is called integrated personal and payment information system, EPS for short. It is meant to curb the excessive spending and mismanagement of uh, public funds. So we see how it further interferes with systems already in organizations. So now is the case study of this work. Now is a very large ODL institution in, in Nigeria, and of course, the largest in West Africa. It already has an existing salary payment structure for its large work staff. And a piece came in, tended to destabilize it, and so it created the problem. Problem of this research is that now has a large workforce, a piece was somewhat imposed on them without adequately sensitizing them or telling them about the need to adopt this policy. So it sort of it came as a surprise to the expected staff, and it caused a lot of rancor. Uh, disunity and misery, especially during paydays, hence the need for this research. We also looked at other bodies of AI. Literature was reviewed in three parts. Once, literature about the concepts of the title of this work, which is AI, the now as the case study, and of course, the this EP, which is the main, uh, the main policy that Created uh, issues. It was. Uh, it is actually a World Bank assisted project, which was supposed to help get a lot of database for manpower planning and to assist government and to ensure probity. It was introduced to Nigeria 
in 2006. Well, the theoretical frameworks we consider were the technological determinism theory of Thompson and Veblen, 1926, which looks at the benefits of technology in society, and the stakeholder theory of Robert Friedman, 1984, which addresses morals and values in organizational management. But our focus for this study is the uh, stakeholder theory. We looked at other reviews, empirical studies done by other universities running this program. And generally, we found out that there is a weak positive correlation or a relationship between EPIS policy and staff welfare. And also that most of the, all the universities we studied, none of them rejected EPIS outrightly, but they argued greatly that EPIS did not adequately cater or capture the university flexibilities and peculiarities. So they called for the review. There is a knowledge gap from what we reviewed. And that is the fact that for as many as we reviewed, there was none that uh, opted for outright rejection. But this particular research in now showed that 15.5% of nine employees opted for outright scrapping of the EPS policy and requested for status quo on the salary structure. Methods, we use the survey research design. Population was the entire noun staff. We took a sample size of 365 respondents and uh, 285 re responded to the uh, questionnaire, showing 77.5% response rate. Uh, the sampling technique was the convenient sample sampling technique. And of course, the research instrument was the questionnaire, which we posted on Google form platforms for people to uh, respond to. My co-author will continue from here while thanking you for listening to me. Dr. Suji, take off. Okay, thank you. Now I will present the result of the service. When we interpreted the data we had, we found out that financial status determine the response speed and rate because the EPS policy implementation caused a lot of financial stress on the population. So those who were more affected by the financial crunch were people who responded very fast and at a higher rate. So in the next question, the first question, our research question we asked, the first uh, question was to determine the awareness of the EPS policy, that's the personnel uh, uh, remuneration system policy, the level of awareness people had about it before implementation. And we found out that the awareness level was very, very low, very low. And uh, this was because of ineffective broadcast or communication failure, because the authorities merely used the traditional method and almost no AI assisted broadcasting tools like the social media and others. Our second research question was to know the common perceptions of staff about the new policy. The perception is generally negative. Majority of people wanted the authorities to review the system and then capture the technicalities that were associated with uh, the flexibility and mobility of academic staff in the university system, which the new system did not uh, consider. So they decided, their perception was that uh, the EPs has no contribution to the success, possibly the stability or the incentive given to workers in their daily activities. And then uh, they wanted the they decided and they confirmed that the EPs is not in their own interest. So the, our research question three was to know what to do to boost the confidence, perception, welfare and productivity of staff. A great majority of them recommended that the peculiarities of the Nigerian university system should be considered. And if this is done, the policy will be accepted. But a reasonable number of people wanted the new system, the new policy EPs to be completely scrapped. And then the old system of payroll should be reinstituted. Now, another 
perception they had or what to do to correct the, the wrong applications is that the inefficiency of the EP's desk officers as people, people who are charged with implementation of the EP system, there are a lot of fraudulent activities, you know, lateness and short payment of remunerations, these things should be stopped so that uh, the staff can now enjoy the new policy if these things are corrected. Now, the next recommendation is that they should have the staff of the universities involved right from the beginning of such decisions. They should be also considered as stakeholders. And in order to correct the low level of awareness, they recommended that government should mount a very wide information campaign so that people will understand the, the system. Now, discussion of our findings. The background to the rejection and failure of this new payroll system is uh, predicated on the insecurity of life and property, the multidimensional poverty, the academic and non-academic trade union activism, activism in Nigeria. So this generated a lot of financial stress, anger, and a very high intolerance for anything that will shorten or delay the payment of uh, remunerations to staff. So looking at this, we saw that uh, only peace and prosperity, that is finance, seem to be the remedies to be applied to solve the situation. Now we go to the contribution of this study. First of all, at the country or national level, we are able to make an in-depth study of the EP's policy and uh, how its rejection and partial failure can be resolved. At the international or global level, what we did was to expand, to create a, an expanded view of the st st uh, stakeholder theory for policy making. The original theory, as uh, said before, was instituted by Robert Friedman in 1984. So having considered why EPs failed in Nigeria, and then thinking of a very good global policy that succeeded, which is the United Nations uh, 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Why did this succeed? Why is this succeeding while a small policy in a, only one country in Nigeria failed? So we discovered the uh, certain empirical facts that were used in the organization of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And this we classified under what we call the five Ps. That is focal points being people, partnership, peace, prosperity, and the planet. So these objectives, we use them to expand the view of the stakeholder theory, and this in order to achieve, this in order to achieve a wider inclusiveness for all when decisions or projects are being considered. The objective is also to reduce the chances of policy rejection. Excuse me. Uh, you have maybe 30, 30 seconds to oh, Okay. So the key, the key have been well, uh, We're always there. Uh, okay. So the statement of the this new extended uh, theory is that the more a policy allows people to work in, in in partnership to achieve peace and prosperity for all and for the planet, the more extensive, acceptable, and sustainable a policy will be. So this uh, the summary of our contribution is therefore. The use the, this research, use the case study of EP's policy implementation, the National Open University of Nigeria, and the model of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals for 2030 to identify, operationalize, and expand the view, the original Robert Freeman stakeholder theory, which was stated in 1984, and this we have been able to do. Thank you very much. Many, 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 many thanks to, to you. And thanks so much to all the speakers for the effort that you've made in uh, summarizing your work in very short notice. I mean, uh, five, 10 minutes is not easy. Uh, I, I really thank all of you. Uh, the last speakers actually centered on, obviously, the policies on APs, uh, AI in broadcasting, uh, where you talked about national, I mean, implemented in a national university in Nigeria, and you have stressed on the importance of multi-stakeholder uh, 
consideration and also partnership and the role of financing being a key area where you also talked about the five P's, which uh, very good uh, recommendation. Uh, the talk uh, on AI and child rights is excellent. I just put some stuff on the chat on, uh, on responsible a d data for children that Professor uh, in Sindhu can also um, look at that app and open to have detailed uh, conversations on that. So on behalf of um, the Chair UNESCO, the organizers, would like to say a big thank you to, to all of you and the great Nigerian team uh, for the excellent presentations that you have brought to the table and we look forward to moving on to uh, next steps uh, in the future. So we'll be taking a break and then we'll come back uh, in the afternoon uh, to continue uh, the session. There'll be a, a session on AI and education uh, that will be uh, discussed um, this afternoon. And then uh, after that, we also have a session on the fundamentals of AI equity, which obviously most of the works that you have done will come into, into play in these roundtable discussions. And during the discussions, feel free to use the chat to throw in questions or suggestions that are in line with your work um, to, to, to ensure that we have a rich discussion. So we want to thank you for your contributions. Many thanks. Ok, merci. Nous avons terminé euh, cette session avec euh, les intervenants. Merci aux intervenants. Et...